Hi everyone, it's Megan with Teach Me ABA and I'm here to talk about another one of everybody's favorite topics, motivating operations, which is task list item B12. And this is part of our BCBA task list five study series. <laughs> So if you want to read about motivating operations for yourself, go check out anything written by Jack Michael. I'm a Jack Michael fangirl. I love the guy and he's pretty easy to read if you give yourself the time. But if you don't want to do that, you can just listen to me blab on about motivating operations because I love them. Depending on who you listen to, there's some debate between uh, Hank Schlinger, who says that we don't need the value altering portion of motivating operations, but I think it's important. Sorry, Dr. Schlinger, love your work, but I'm gonna go with Jack Michael on this one. Motivating operations have two effects. First, they alter the value of something as a reinforcer or a punisher. And second, because this value is altered, it makes a behavior more or less likely to occur in a given moment. In 1993, one of Jack Michael's students, Laraway et al., uh, they developed the terms abolishing and establishing operations because motivating operations don't only increase behavior or make things reinforcing, they can also make things less reinforcing. So if we think about Skinner's interpretation of satiation and deprivation, satiation is a, an abolishing operation. Uh, it makes something less valuable. You've had enough of it, you've had too much of it, you don't want any more. So that's one abolishing operation. Deprivation is an establishing operation because it makes you want something more. When you don't have something, you want it, right? Establishing operations make something more valuable and so you're more likely to engage in behaviors that in the past have been reinforced with that item. So say you're hungry, you're more likely to uh, get on your phone and order some Postmates, uh, ask someone to make you a sandwich. Um, all of the behaviors that in the past have led, that have led to food will occur when that establishing operation of hunger is present. In contrast, abolishing operations make behaviors less likely to occur. So when you've just eaten a sandwich, you're not hungry anymore, having already eaten is an abolishing operation. So I see on a lot of the social media forums, people saying, why do I even need to know about motivating operations? Why do I need to know the different condition motivating operations? And the reason that they're important is because if you're teaching mans or if you're seeing problematic behavior, you need to know what in the environment is driving those behaviors, what's motivating that individual. If you can make them more or less motivated for certain things, then you can really control a lot of their behavior not that we're all about controlling people, but we want to enhance their opportunities for success and manipulating motivating operations can really help in that. Okay, don't hate me, but now we're gonna go through all the different condition motivating operations because they're on the exam. So even if you hate them, you have to know them. So let's do it. The first type of condition motivating operation, I'm gonna start calling them CMOs because it's way shorter, uh, is the reflexive CMO. So CMO R. And when I think of this one, it makes me think of how I have a reflex that makes me want to get away from people that I don't like. So I see that supervisor that I don't like walking down towards the hallway. So I am going to go hide in the bathroom because she's a CMO R. So when we're thinking about CMORs, think about those aversive situations that somebody wants to get away from. A lot of times this is, this leads to problem behavior. And so if we're thinking about, oh, why is this situation a conditioned aversive and how can I make it less aversive? That's how you're going to utilize this concept within your clinical practice. The next CMO that we're going to talk about is the transitive CMO. So CMOT. And this is where one stimulus establishes another stimulus as a reinforcer. So it transfers its effectiveness as a reinforcer. 
There was a great article published in 1987 actually using CMOTs uh, to teach kids to man for missing. So that's really the clinical application here. My publication, gonna hype it up again, Piles et al. 2021. I use CMOTs in that project to establish information as a reinforcer. So just think about when you're transferring that reinforcer effectiveness, that's where you're seeing the CMOT. Clinically, you might use this to teach mans for missing. So that 1987 article is an interrupted chain procedure. And so you basically give somebody something and withhold another item that they need to actually make this first thing reinforcing. So think about giving a kid a bowl of cereal without a spoon. Um, some kids are messy and they'll just go for it, so you need to teach that prereq. But when you give that bowl, if they eat with a spoon, that bowl is going to establish a spoon as a reinforcer. So you can have that missing item, get the kid to ask for it, which actually increases the independence of man's all around, and that's how you're going to utilize this concept in your clinical work. The last CMO is the surrogate CMO, which really is not used very often in clinical applications, but for whatever reason, somebody came up with it and wrote about it, so you need to know it for the test. So the surrogate CMO is where one item substitutes as another to establish something as a reinforcer. I can't really think of any good examples. It's not used clinically, but just know that it's one thing substituting for another because it might be on the exam. Cool, so again, I'm Megan with Teach Me ABA, knocking out all of the most hated task list items on task list five. I hope you're having fun studying, so like, share, leave a comment if you have any questions, and we'll be happy to answer. Do, do, do.